Okay, coming back to the baseline investigation of the EEG, thanks to Hans Berger, who invented it in the 18th century. We have seen seizures in front of us and the parents in children or in adults, the people who are staying with them in the hostels or labor camps. Now with the videos in their mobile phone, yeah. they show us. Yeah. But still we take the EEG to document the electrophysiological status of the brain. The EEG, once it is normal, how do we proceed? Yeah. Second, what are the differences between the EEG readings in the child and adult? I know the difference in interpretation because the rhythms change yeah. according to the mm -hmm. age of the child. But then, for the general interest, could you please throw light on the EEG reporting? Yeah, I think one statement that is really crucial here is that um, epilepsy is a clinical diagnosis. Yes. So if I'm working in uh, the deepest part of Amazon forest with nothing with me, I can still ma manage children with epilepsy mm -hmm. if I have the medication. So what many people think is that EEG is the diagnostic test for epilepsy. It is not. That's, That's very clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And many a times your EEG might be entirely normal and you might yeah. have the more you know, severe form of epilepsy that mm -hmm. can happen. So just to give you a statistics, you know, if I pick up 100 children from the street and all of them who have epilepsy, proven epilepsy and seizures, and there's a big percentage of chance that the EEG might be normal. Actually, 20% of them might have completely normal EEG, one in five. Whereas if I just turn that around and if I pick up 100 children who never have seizures in their life and don't have epilepsy, but 5% will have abnormal EEG. Mm -hmm. So you would wrongly put these kids onto treatment. So uh, what I would tell my colleagues in, in every seminar or talk that I give is that don't rely on EEG to make a decision whether the child has epilepsy or not. That's a clinical decision. Once you've made your clinical decision that yes, this child has epilepsy, the next question for you to ask of the EEG is what type of epilepsy it is uh, or how severe it is, where is it coming from? So if you ask the right question, the EEG will answer you with the right uh, response. But if you ask the wrong question, it's going to take you in a wrong direction. That's what I explained. Yeah. Yeah, what about the utilization of video EEG in your practice in UK versus the present scenario? Uh, video EGs are more and more used now than before. I mean, yeah. uh, previously, uh, many of the hospitals or facilities didn't have video EGs. We used to do a run of 45 minutes to 60 minutes and conclude and give the report. Exactly. Either normal or abnormal. Yeah. So what about just cardiologists have gone with the holter yeah. as well as extended recording yeah. of the cardiac rhythm for up yeah. to 72 hours. Yeah. So neurologists also, yeah. we have decided to take longer sessions of video recordings. So in pediatric practice, every EG that I do is at least an hour long. And all of the EGs are connected with a video monitor for me. That's the end of Now, if I think that I need to prolong the EG or a 24-hour overnight, overnight okay. EG or even a five-day video telemetry, mm. that's when I will do a video EG by admitting the patient into the hospital. So that depends upon what question you're trying to answer and what condition you're looking for right. and how often or how frequent the episodes are happening, whether you're trying to capture the episode or not. So it, it depends on which case you're discussing here. But uh, video telemetry has immensely come forward now. We have ambulatory v video EGs now, mm. where you can take the video the monitor as well as the EEG leads with the uh, connections and everything with you at home and get all the recording and bring the child back next day with all uh, everything on your table. So okay. yeah. Now very importantly we come to the drug. Whatever be the type of physical examination or investigations, the outcome of a consultation with a doctor is a prescription which is signed and sealed. That gives the confidence whether the patient is getting the medicine based out of insurance mediclaim or whether he is paying from his pocket depending upon the type of medical business which is happening to us. What is the choice of anti-epileptic drugs? We have time-tested first-generation yeah. drugs like phenobarbitone, phenytoin sodium, carbamazepine and sodium valproate. Okay. Then derivatives like oxcarbazepine and divalproic sodium came. Then we have a host of other drugs like levetiracetam, vigabatrin, gabapentin, and so many newer generation drugs which have come like lacosamide etc. I know all of us know the entire spectrum of the drugs which are available in the market. How is the choice done? And the question to both of you separately is, is the doctor who refers the patient to you first has made a right choice or he directly has jumped to a third generation drug without any evidence? Again, in pediatric practice, when I see a child, I mean, I'm most satisfied when I have given the right treatment or not given a treatment to a patient. For example, there are many epilepsies that don't require anti-epileptics. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we uh, overlook this. Uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of Rolandic epilepsy. Yeah. Or, and many a times now we don't put children on treatment who have infrequent seizures, like one seizure a year or two seizures a year. You, we, they probably don't need treatment for it. And this is a remitting uh, condition which in two years time will go away. So if you pick those up, 
and you can reassure parents that your child doesn't require treatment and you actually go past those two years and the child goes into remission, that gives me the most satisfaction. Now coming back to anti-epileptic drugs, as you rightly said, it has evolved over time. We have more than 30, 35 anti-epileptics now. The, and over the years, not much has changed in terms of efficacy. Mm. So the efficacy has remained pretty much the same. Right. We mm. could treat 66% of epilepsies that before. That might have become 70 or 75. Yeah, yeah. so it's still, still negligible. Mm. Is 20 to 25. But yeah. What has happened is the uh, tolerability has improved. So you have, as you said, the phenobarbitone, the phenytoins, these were old granddad medications which used to cause a lot of complications in kids or even, even in adults. Mm. But they were very effective when given yes. at the right time and in acute circumstances. Well, now what has happened is, as you said, sodium valproate, levetra and you know the newer anti-epileptics they're giving you the option of starting them uh, knowing that the child will uh, kind of uh, take this on board without having many side effects and it will be very effective as well so that has changed it has given us more options to use your second question if my colleague pediatrician has started a child on a wrong drug a, yeah I would say a wrong drug or a less optimal drug um, if I think that that's within the realm of um, acceptability I would continue that because chopping and changing is not the best way to move forward but if I believe this is completely wrong, for example, using carbamazepine in a child with epilepsy. A, an absence of epilepsy, yes. that's a complete no-no, then I would explain to parents and I would move that on slowly onto the right anti-epileptic. So again, it's very situational. But uh, that pediatrician, not all patients actually come to us. Right. Many of these patients who are put on the wrong medication just go on for years yeah. on that wrong medication, uh, having seizures. Mm, yes. So the pediatrician should know his or her limitations to make the referral to the next stage. Yeah, I am re-emphasizing that. And there are some medication, maybe you know better than me, which can aggravate seizure yeah. or make it, makes it worse. Right? Yes, yes, yes. They have exactly. pro-convulsant uh, yeah. activity yeah. as well. Yeah. To you, when we convince the patient about epilepsy surgery, it is just uh, like in ophthalmology. The people generally believe that after cataract surgery, no glasses are required, mm. which is wrong. So after epilepsy surgery, do these patients require maintenance anti-epileptic drugs? Uh, of course, um, there are two types of epilepsy surgery. Curative, meaning that some, some syndromes or some uh, procedures can cure. For example, racemucin encephalitis, when you do hemispherectomy, usually zero, see, usually 90%, nothing 100%. How you taper it? Of course, we work as a team, not the surgeon who decides stop the medication today or tomorrow, no. Usually, the epilepsy program or the epilepsy monitoring unit usually consists of team, uh, new epilepsy surgeon, pediatric epileptologist, adult epileptologist, neuropsychologist, pharmacologist, and neuroradiologist. Every decision all the way through the process is made by the team, uh, epilepsy team, which is, consists of those, all these members. So every decision regarding surgery, what type of surgery even is taken by the team. For example, is it resective surgery? Is it uh, uh, palliative surgery? Is it uh, uh, continuing medication, stop medication, change the medication? Is in my team, it's taken by the whole members of those. And now, after surgery, of course, patient will continue on medication for at least six months till we see the success of the surgery, the procedure. Is it successful? Is it no seizure completely after surgery? And if in some syndromes, in some procedures, yes, we taper gradually by the team till we stop the, com the medication completely. Majority of them, no, will continue. For example, if they were in three, will continue on at least one medication over the years. And they will be closely monitored by the epileptologist. Yes. So the, 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 the work of the surgeon is the surgical procedure. The medication will be taken care of the uh, uh, medical team. As he correctly mentioned, it's a limitation. You should know what is it. I don't step on medication and uh, try to manipulate it. No. Yeah. Now coming to the mm -hmm. ideal situation where the correct epilepsy type has been identified. Say the example of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. The clinical features fit into the EEG and we have started the right medicine of sodium valproate. What about the compliance and how do we monitor the side effects of these drugs? Are the patients taking the drugs properly, especially the children, are the patients being catered to at their homes properly with their parents and do they turn up for the periodic liver function tests and when we recommend for the serum anti-epileptic drug levels. Okay, I guess that's for me. Um, uh, I think younger ones, I'm talking about up to eight, nine years of age when children are purely dependent on their parents, 
we do not see this as a major, major problem. It does happen, but compliance is not a major issue because the responsibility lies on parents directly. And uh, if at times we believe that the child is not being given the medication or for whatever reason is not responding, we do anti-epileptic drug levels to check whether that drug is being given or not. The main problem with compliance comes in teenage group mm. when the dependence is moving from parents to the child itself mm. and when they have their own mind and their own demands, that's when they decide not to take it yeah. or they take it sporadically which is even worse yeah. on and off. And at that point of time, even doing a drug level might be difficult because they are very clever. They might take the drug before uh, yeah, doing the test. Yeah. So we have to rely on a number of things in those situations. One, uh, we have to convince the child who may be 14, 15, 16 years of age that now that he or she will be taking the responsibility completely. And if she or he continues to have seizures, what the implications are for the future and the career. And most of the, in most of the cases when we discuss it with them, they accept it and they take the ownership. We cannot do a 24-hour monitoring to make sure they are taking the medication and they don't rely on their parents to take the medications That's anyways. Right. So it again depends on what the age of the child is, at least in pediatric neurology, how we monitor compliance in these kids. Yeah. And this is the uh, emphasis of uh, counseling yes. and spending more time with, the, with this yeah. type of patient. And the, you just spend time, okay, them, have a kind of a relationship with them you know, uh, have their phone number, call them. It's, it's nice, really nice. Do and they, they, they will the call you and they will say, I have this, I have headache. Even they call in the night, I have headache. So you just have their relationship. Number two, they take the advantage of the new technology, the mobiles. You know, uh, for example, the family, show me the seizure, even in the middle of another. I, uh, they they were, call yeah, record, show the me the seizures. Yeah. Yeah. Number three, the calendar. Just uh, ask the f family to mark. Ha mark. What time is the seizure? How is the seizure? How long is the seizure? And really, th you, uh, you will be surprised. They will come with a big uh, note that uh, at 7.15, 7.20, like that. I mean, he, he knows yeah, better than me. So it's amazing uh, awareness how can uh, bear fruit. Yeah. Now coming to the issue of uh, the general life of the epileptic patient. You started by telling that there is a stigma, mm -hmm. even in many developed and developing countries. Yeah, yeah. So, when I also treat adults who previously graduated from childhood with a seizure and continuing the medication, after 16, 17 or 18 they shift to me in adulthood, the parents will ask about the restrictions. Of course, in a neonate or an infant or a toddler, they won't ask whether they can go for kickboxing or swimming. Yeah. So, what are the restrictions that are scientifically to be advised for a child with epilepsy? Um, adventure sports because sure. in this part of the country there are so many options on a weekend you can land up with one of these uh, catastrophic events also provided the patient and the family is not advised too properly um, in my experience we as parents we over restrict our children mm. when they have epilepsy and even the messages that are passed on by my colleagues and pediatricians is excessive in terms of restriction this is exactly what I tell my patients, say, if, you, if I have a 10-year-old child who's been developed newly with, who's been diagnosed with epilepsy, and the first question is, so how it's going to affect his life? That's the first question parents ask. And I take them into reassurance by saying, in no way. Your child's life is going to remain the same as it was before. And that just starts off the conversation in a, in a good, at a good level. And that, then I justify that, why I'm saying that. The only thing that is going to change in their child's life is he'll be taking this medication twice a day. In terms of sports, I don't restrict them from doing anything, except there are some changes with what they do before the uh, uh, adventure sports. So for example, if they're going for swimming, yes. I make sure that the lifeguard who's there knows about the diagnosis and is standing outside the pool and observing your child. Or if parents are observing it, that's fine. Yeah. They ask me specific questions. I had a recently a child who is a national level in the UK, a national level swimmer, and she was uh, number three within the uh, uh, national ranks. And she was diagnosed with epilepsy and uh, they asked me, is this going to affect her endurance and her ability? And the answer is no, it won't. And the medication won't affect her. But if she is very cautious about her medication, monitoring of her seizures and her sleep, then she can have a completely normal lifestyle and she can carry on her profession as she wanted to. So taking them into confidence, giving them reassurance and building their confidence even further is what's required. In this okay. Now, the common questions that are answered by the doctors, some questions are asked and we answer. Some we give as blanket statements. Number one, about the intelligence, because we said it is a gray matter disease. All epileptics don't go uh, 
with mental retardation or abnormalities or anything. Vast majority of them can excel in their life in academics. If an epileptic child is a poor performer, do we have to identify any other thing? Because I have found out hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, certain other metabolic diseases also coexisting with an epilepsy and that may be the causes of sporadic scholastic backwardness. I would divide this into two parts. One is you can have coexisting uh, problems. For yes. example, you might have a child with a neurocutaneous syndrome mm. who has a number of different problems including epilepsy as a part of that genetic disorder. Mm. In that case, epilepsy is probably not contributing so much to the overall quality of life of the patient. The child has uh, intellectual disability along with epilepsy yeah. and it's a part of a common genetic disorder. But on the other hand, in a child with refractory epilepsy, the epilepsy that is not controlled, the epilepsy itself can cause problems with the cognition in the long run. Yes. And those are the ones we need to try and control to, to make sure that what's in our control, which is controlling the seizures and reducing the cognitive effects in the future. So we have to make this, this, this distinction. And coming back to the diagnosis, which is the first thing you do when a child comes to you, you have to rule out these conditions that can probably contribute towards intellectual disability, like hypothyroidism and parathyroidism. That's something we do as a routine before making a diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And in childhood, how do we analyze the family history? As we know, congenital twin is a first degree relative and then we go to the second degree relatives, parents, cousins, etc. And genetically, a first cousin is a third degree relative. So up to which level do we probe the family history for a possible seizure? So usually we ask a blanket statement initially. I mean, if a child has epilepsy, do you have anybody else with epilepsy in your family? And yes. generally the answer will be, oh, no, no, I have, I'm not sure. Then they will come up with yeah. some examples. Yes. yes, and then when you probe even further, I'm not just talking about you, the father or mother, can you tell just think about it a little beyond that, your cousins or your parents or your uh, parents' cousins and so forth. Then and remember. we take them back into that at least two or three generations to say, does anybody have this condition? And then when they come up and say, oh, by the way, uh, his uncle yes. had a similar condition at a similar age with similar outcome, that's when you know that you've picked up a genetic link there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when we practice in the UAE, almost 95% of patients are having the treatment investigations and even surgery based on their medical insurance which is provided by the employer or the family member. So do you feel that the entire gamut of investigations and the entire spectrum of treatment processes would be honestly covered by this insurance and what is your perspective of your practice in this country for the last four years? Or at times do we need to refer them to special centers in the government facilities because they are also doing a yeoman job by accepting patients with status epilepticus, non-primary seizures, etc. I mean, um, in this part of the world, insurance is pretty a new phenomena uh, as compared to US, for example, yeah. where it's been going on for ages. So we have a lot to learn from the insurance perspective. And we do struggle sometimes to convince the insurance companies that this particular investigation is necessary yeah. to uh, give the right treatment for the patient and improve the quality of life. For example, I'll give you a simple example, ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. which is a proven treatment modality for refractory seizures. And to get an insurance approval for that is sometimes very difficult. Same thing with, uh, it was with vagal nerve stimulation, but now it's easier because understanding has improved. And I'm sure Dr. Tabeti would agree that many of the vagal nerve stimulation patients actually get through their insurance because the understanding with the insurance company has improved and the link has been made. Okay. Yeah. So. And uh, plus, uh, in addition to the understanding, uh, you show them statistics. Show them, uh, you know, what is the international standard Scientific of measurement. Data and meta analysis that of such procedures. Show them your results. Show them scientific results and show them number. First, when we start the epilepsy surgery program, was as he mentioned correctly difficult to convince them or to uh, just uh, ask them for colostomy or hemispherectomy. Because honestly, just let us be frank, they don't know what is hemispherectomy. I assure you, they, he doesn't know what, what this hemispherectomy means. So when you explain to them and you call them and you, uh, uh, you know, um, invite them and show them the patient post of how he's not devastated as they think or, you know, he's, uh, you know, intubated, ventilated in the ICU and no seizures, you know, with time, your results prove your point. There are a lot of adjuvant drugs which are used in the treatment of epilepsy. You know about acetazolamide, we know about uh, injection ACTH for uh, hip arrhythmia, etc. So, do you feel that these drugs still hold water when we have newer anti-epileptic drugs available? 
Absolutely. I mean, although they treat the same condition, I think they have a different pathway. Mm. And something like steroids, whether it is ACTH or uh, prednisolone or... Cosintropin or... Cosintropin. And these are required because there is an element of autoimmunity in these conditions. There is an element of inflammation in epilepsy, like Rasmussen's and... IV gamma globulin is one of the Absolutely. treatment choices yeah. before hemispherectomy. But identifying the right patient mm. who would respond to that anti-inflammatory drug is important. Mm. Acetazolamide, as you said, is a medication we use in very specific areas in children. But um, having said that, uh, these are adjuncts. So many a times you have put a child on an anti-epileptic medication and because you now believe that there is an element of inflammation, you're considering using an uh, anti-inflammatory drug like a steroid. So this has to be carried out at a, a level where like a pediatric neurologist or an adult neurologist who have an experience with this. I would not recommend pediatricians going into this and uh, treating children at that level. This is very specific. Uh, Condition and syndrome is not, not all the... Yeah, and yeah, yeah, because West syndrome, yeah, it is yeah. a very rare entity. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Now, problem. when it comes to practice in adults, I face that the liver function tests or the routine analysis of blood and urine we do once in three months may not be the real side effect the patient is worried about. A girl, if he, she is given phenytoin, she may go in for hirsutism. Sodium valproate will cause weight gain yeah. and alopecia which also affects the cosmetic appearance of that individual. So technically, the patient may be seizure-free and the serum anti-epileptic levels or the liver function test will be normal. Do you feel that just because of cosmetic disfigurement, a stable epilepsy, you may have to change a drug on demand? Um, case by case again. Yes. And uh, have I done it maybe in two or three cases? I have stopped sodium valproate when the child's weight went beyond yeah. in a teenage girl and she herself didn't want to continue. Same because situation it has happened uh, yeah. to me as well. It affects their compliance. Yes. If you push them and force them, they, they will, will not, not take, take the drug. Exactly. So you have to give in at times and say, okay, we have an alternative, mm -hmm. but there is a risk that the seizures might come back, mm -hmm. but we have to try it. We can try it. I think usage of anti-epileptic uh, drug levels, they, they are overused sometimes. If you make management of epilepsy really difficult uh, and visits even more, the compliance go down, goes down. So you have to make management of epilepsy easier for them. Yeah. So I reduce the number of anti-epileptic routine levels that people check. Some, some pediatricians do it every three months. That is I, not required. Not I required. Do so. You know, in some cases I do them maybe once a year. And in some stable children I, I might not even do them That's because true. the compliance is good, the outcome is good. I'll just wait for the child to go through the two-year period of seizure freedom and then take it off. So again, it's case-by-case -case basis, I would yeah. say. Another interesting element in treatment of epilepsy that I have come across is a patient may have multiple type of seizure. He might have come initially for a typical generalized tonic, tonic seizures with biting of the tongue, frothing from the nostrils and the mouth, bladder and bubble incontinence, and the tonic and clonic phase. And the diagnosis would have been straightforward. A medicine like uh, phenotoin or sodium valproate might have been started. And then the patient has another seizure. So history taking, again, is much more important. If he comes with another partial seizure or a myoclonic seizure, as you know, there are different types of multi-type seizure, yeah. which also is one of the reasons why certain things go to refractory epilepsy. Yeah. What is your experience in the pediatric population? Yeah, so uh, that is the cornerstone of every seizure. So it's not the EEG or so, so much. It's more about how you approach your patient. You mentioned this earlier, ILAE or International League Against Epilepsy has a set of an algorithm how we approach these yeah. patients. So the first question is, what you saw, is that a seizure or not? And that's where we go wrong most of the time. Maybe vasovagal syncope then, then and the situational... Mimics so of so epilepsy so are so hundreds so of yes. them. And it's usually that's the answer. It's not the seizure. It's actually a non-seizure event. If you assure that this is a seizure, the next question is what type of seizure it is. Is it a generalized tonic-clonic, myoclonic, absence, uh, atonic? What type of seizure it is? And once you have known that if the child has polymorphic epilepsy, different types of seizures, then you think about with the age of the patient and the EEG, what syndrome it is. So whether this is childhood absence epilepsy or juvenile myoclonic epilepsy Lena, or so forth. Lena Augusto. Lena Augusto. And that will determine what treatment you would consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you go in a systematic manner, you will it will take you in the right direction. So what I was telling time. is, even in a stable case which we apparently feel, history taking is still important. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. the third seizure may be a different type. Yeah. It's the cornerstone, the history and the semiology. Yeah. yeah. In my opinion, you know, they, they tell you where is the focus, the semiology. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Number very important issue with the pediatric. It's important, in my opinion, to, to watch the interrected. Mm -hmm. That's why the well, where is the long monitoring is important. That's true. Because uh, we know that the, the, all the study now show that 
the decline of cognition not because of seizure. Maybe the child one year no, having no see, no clinical seizure, but having a frequent interrectal, that will affect him. Yeah. So having no seizure doesn't mean the patient is not seizing. No. And in many, in many uh, situations, child, especially in children, and he knows better than me, uh, patient having daily seizure and the patient will report no seizure. Another important uh, referral that the neurologist also has to make, always we think about the portal of references towards us. Many a time, the loss of consciousness may not be a seizure. After taking a history, a detailed physical examination, imaging of the brain if required, and surely a couple of EEGs for more than 60 minutes per session, it may be a cause of cardiac syncope in adult. And if we refer to a cardiologist in the adult side, he may do a holter and find out that the patient was having from six sinus syndrome. And instead of AED, he may finally land up with a permanent pacemaker. Yeah. What about the pediatric cardiac conditions which come with syncope and how they are identified? Of course, we are not experts in auscultating yeah. the heart and at what level we consider referring to our colleagues in other no. pediatric subspecialties. Uh, what's crucial there is the semiology itself. So uh, syncopes or cardiogenic uh, faints, for example, or falls have a complete different semiology. But as compared if the history is not very clear, especially yeah. if a child is brought from school. Yeah. yeah. So many a times what we call as a gray area, you're not sure whether this is falling into the epileptic seizure or this is a non-epileptic cardiogenic seizure. You're not sure. In that case, you do, you, you do both as such. And I refer to a cardiologist and the cardiologist eventually looks at the child, may I end up doing a holter, an ECG, just a routine ECG or and an, an, echo, echocardiogram. an echocardiogram and rule out life-threatening conditions in this case like prolonged QT syndrome is one of them where it has to be diagnosed and treated early. Uh, thankfully, it's rare. So many a times it's a simple faint. Mm. It's a simple faint as for laymen, it's a simple uh, and many of us have a tendency to faint when we stand up, postural tendency. We have something called as postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome where our body cannot adopt to a certain posture and we fall. In those cases, a lifestyle change is required. In very rare circumstances, medications are required. But we involve the cardiologist and we work together to improve the quality of life in that patient. Now in a child, adolescent or adult, there are so many people who don't religiously practice lifestyle events. I am focusing on adolescent alcoholism, substance abuse, etc. Suppose the epileptic child or adult under consideration is compliant to the anti-epileptic drug but at the same time has a habit of alcoholism or substance abuse. Is it difficult for you to elicit and extract the history in front of the patient and his relatives? And if so, we have to definitely oppose that action yeah. which may cut down the confidence, the fellow will may have a, a guilt. So how do you approach such psychological issues concurrent with the medications? I think this will be much easier for an adult neurologist to answer yeah. because you come across this more often. Thankfully, sure. us, we don't. But I do see, you know, 15, 16 year olds who, who indulge in many of the, uh, these substance activities, abuse. substance abuse and, and of course, lack of compliance and all that. There is something called as competency. So if the child is um, Gillick or Fraser competent, it's a term we use to assess the competency of a child to suggest whether he or she can make a decision for himself. And some 15, 16 year olds are so mature that they, you can sit down and talk with them to understand that they can take a decision for themselves. So they went and uh, they give the correct, uh, correct response. Yes. And if you understand the child is doing that, he, he is taking um, an illicit drug or something like that, you have to take the child into confidence and then involve the parents within the discussion to come to a good management strategy for the child. And simultaneously, you may require the help of a clinical psychologist also. Always, always. I mean, a neuropsychologist, especially neuropsychologist post-epilepsy uh, as such is crucial in managing these patients because not only they help the child to understand the level of intellectual ability and help them to understand how they can learn better but also help them to improve their quality of life and think for themselves. So any team that manages epilepsy or has an epilepsy program, a neuropsychologist and a clinical psychologist are the key. Now coming to the difference between the private sector and the government sector. Back in UK everything is covered under the umbrella of NHS. But here, many of us have chosen the private service for our own reasons, whereas there are equally good or better hospitals in the government sector as well, in all the Emirates. We have beautiful hospitals like SKMC, Mafrak Hospital in uh, Abu Dhabi Emirate, and we have also Rashid Hospital and other uh, brilliant centers of excellence in 
the government mm. sector in Dubai. So for a referral pattern from the general population, is it easy for the general practitioners and physicians and pediatricians to refer directly to government or do they have a long waiting time? And is that the reason why the private clinics are mushrooming? Uh, what I is your perspective on a statistical know-how? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can talk for both of us, in fact, and I'm sure Dr. Altabethi can expand on that. Um, I think because we are at a tertiary level, you know, a pediatric neurologist or a neurosurgeon, it's, we, we see what comes with froths up the tip of the iceberg. So we don't get kind of pushed with um, straightforward epilepsies or children with febrile seizures and all that. So we can manage it because we see the, the difficult ones that come through, refractory ones that comes through. But in a government hospital, uh, everything goes through. So obviously they are burdened a lot. Mm -hmm. And in you know, UAE with a population of nearly 10 million, I think having the number of uh, government hospitals, we even need more than what we have, I think. And many, many times this spills out because either they have a long waiting time, as you rightly said, and then they come to the private sector. And what's been happening over the last 10 years in this country is basically we are trying to, we are winning the trust back of patients. And that's, you know, I used to do visiting clinics from UK in one of the hosp private hospitals here about eight years ago. And even when I make a simple diagnosis of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, a patient used to decide to go to their home country or maybe UK or the US to get a second opinion because the lack of trust was there. Eight years down the line now, that doesn't happen very often. Mm. So the trust, we've almost won the trust back for these patients and they're believing in you, whether it's government, whether it's private sector, because on the, now they're trusting the doctors that they come and see. And the here. level of intelligence of this country has changed. Absolutely. And uh, as I mentioned, the awareness has, has increased now. So they, they are aware now. Remember, these patients are desperate. For example, they are intractable, already intractable to medication or resistant to medication. So they are, they seek other opinion and they know this center treat the difficult cases, this center treat surgically, this thing. I mean, th there is awareness, increase in awareness. So uh, I think, and the government, of course, say finger, uh, a huge number of patients and they are doing great job. Great job. Yeah. What do you see the scope of marketing of a private organization? Whether it is a dedicated pediatric neurology clinic or whether it is a big hospital with a big brand like Suleiman Al Habib, what do you feel? exactly should be marketed do we have to give a lot of data about individual diseases and the spectrum of services that we give or generally we have to please the doctors by giving pleasantries inviting them for cmes what should be the ideal strategy while uh, i'll give you an example of neuropedia because we opened about 18 months ago and we used awareness as a tool for marketing so marketing is just a, a side effect of the awareness anyways. So we went about doing a lot of talks and seminars and symposiums, just explaining to colleagues and mm. public and nursing staff and everybody what epilepsy is, what is what is new in epilepsy, and doing seminars and giving them CME points for that. That was providing knowledge to um, our colleagues and public. And winning the, the confidence of the doctors. Absolutely. Yeah. And at the same time, marketing happened. Mm. It was just a side effect of the thing. So uh, with Neuropedia, we didn't go about marketing ourselves out there. We just put ourselves into the awareness mode and the marketing just came along. But uh, many of the hospitals are doing a great job to, to get into the public, you know, to public and say that we are here, we have a program like Suleiman Habib, they're probably the only private hospital that has an epilepsy surgery program currently. So they have marketed well and now we know that this is an area where we can, we as neurologists can send patients to when there is an epilepsy surgery required. So I feel that uh, we have interacted a lot regarding a topic of sinister significance. And uh, before we conclude, I would like to reiterate that this program will be aired by Medibis Television. Medibis Television is founded by Mr. S.K. Sohan Roy. He is also the founder and vice president of an organization called World Medical Council. The president of the World Medical Council is uh, radiologist Dr. Mulk from Dubai. And uh, I am the general secretary of the WMC. So this goes hand in hand. And I'm sure that this edited program, with perhaps subtitling, will be aired and live streamed to around 100 plus countries at a later point of time. Mm -hmm. So before we conclude, I would just like to thank both of you for your kind participation you. and the quality of answers that we have shared amongst we three neuroscientists would be of tremendous help and use for the viewers. Before we wind up the session, 
I would uh, invite you for a final comments on this topic of epilepsy regarding the future or how artificial intelligence, robotics, etc. would help you in surgery and also the perspective of genetic investigations, whether they would be covered. The screening programs for relatives with epilepsy should ideally they also be covered under the insurance companies and their TPAs. The three things. Number one, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you and thank the staff for the, this kind of great opportunity for us to learn and for for us all to, to shed, light, shed light to the society and for awareness of this kind of uh, difficult disease. Number two, I think science is, is evolving. So what is surgical now, maybe not tomorrow. What was, what was medical in the past, now it is surgical. So it's, uh, things are evolving with the new technology, with less complication now. We can resect any part of the brain with no complication because the brain mapping, intraoperative, intracranial recording. So things are evolving with uh, bigger surgery, with lesser complication. And maybe tomorrow, this kind of even uh, uh, surgical uh, cases, maybe not with the genetic engineering, with the increasing awareness, with the, with the health awareness, and many other uh, factors. So we just keep uh, doing what we are doing and uh, seek the, the, the best um, to our uh, patients and uh, so keep we keep with the latest technologies yeah, yeah. and, and keep educating and ourselves on a daily basis. This is very important for the doctor not to lay back and uh, it is a continuous learning it's process. A continuous learning process, especially in the private sector. In the government sector, there is conferences and international meetings. I, I find out in the private sectors, uh, is the, the practice is taking the time. So uh, I, I take this opportunity to, to, to advise uh, myself and my colleague to continue educating themselves for the best of their right. uh, practice. Um, as a closing statement, but firstly, thank you for inviting me. I think it was fantastic hours spent. Um, clinical genetics, the question that you asked, um, we've come a long way. I mean, I'm sure yeah. the public even would know yeah. in 2001 when the genome was uh, human opened genome up, project, human yeah. genome project came out, we could entirely decipher our entire DNA. And how that has helped is just, you know, it's amazing to know how genetics have moved forward in the last yeah. two decades. Engineering. We could see chromosomes initially, and that's all, as, as small worms in a microscope. And now we can go within the chromosomes and see a gene, and within a gene and see exons, and within the exon and see nucleotides, to the depth where you can actually find out if there's a single mutation, and if we can, now we've started correcting it yeah. to have genetic manipulations yes. to improve the disease. That's I mean, true. that's a topic for a different discussion. But we are getting there. But having said that, not going into the intricacies of it, I think the most important aspect that we as professionals and public should be doing is to try and make this disease stigma free. Yeah. I think that's what's key because these patients' quality of life is not affected by that one or two seizures they have so much. It's about what people think about them in the society and mainly for children at school and from the teachers. That's something, the public awareness of stigma that is attached to the disease. We are doing a great job and the government is doing a great job in taking it out. But I think there's a long way to go before we make that child confident that his or her life is the same as any other child that goes with them at school. Absolutely. So thank you thank to you. both of you thank and uh, myself, Dr. Vinod, signing off today. Thank you.